Uh, welcome back, everybody, to this week's edition of Thoughts from the Movies. I'm Justin Luteran, joined by Josh Alsace and Austin Moorhead, the Thoughts from the Movies crew, as usual. Uh, one thing before we get started this week, uh, we always like to take a moment to recognize uh, past film industry members who have passed away recently. Uh, and this week, we had another unfortunate death. Uh, Grant Imahara, who a lot of people know from Mythbusters, spent a lot of his career working uh, in visual effects and special effects. He worked for Lucas Films and ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, working on all kinds of uh, George Lucas movies like Star Wars and uh, Jurassic Park with Spielberg and the Matrix movies and things like that. You know, you can see here he revolutionized R2-D2 and uh, he was a contestant on BattleBots and again on Mythbusters. So uh, for his contributions, we just want to say uh, rest in peace, Grant. Thanks for everything you did uh, for the industry and you will be missed uh, by many. Uh, boys, this week we are doing Joshua's pick, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Spielberg's, one of Spielberg's classics, uh, which, you know, everyone I'm sure has seen at this point. It's interesting because this is the first time we've done a movie that we have all seen. Uh, usually one or some combination have not seen the movies, which makes them, you know, interesting conversation. But this will be a little different this week. But we're going to have a lot of cool clips and, uh, again, images and things like that. So leave a comment. Let us know what you guys think. If we uh, miss anything or if there's another thing that you uh, think of that you want to add to the comment section, drop us a line. Boys, opening thoughts here. Uh, the, since we all have seen this movie before, I want to ask you when the last time you saw it was and what you remember thinking about the movie from the last time. And we'll see if it changed now that you're watching it later in life. But uh, go for it. Whoever wants to take that one first. Last time you saw E.T. and what you thought of it then. Uh, Austin, Josh, any volunteers? Austin? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, been a while since I've seen this, honestly. Probably maybe when I was like in between that like 10 and 12 age i think so it's been quite a while about you know six 14 to 16 years i don't know if that's math right or not but who knows um and i remember just for some reason being like really scared of like all the sound in this like being so loud and my ears would always hurt when i was watching this movie and now when i'm like almost partially deaf like it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't really hurt as bad but um, it's been a while. It was a real treat to see it again. Okay. Interesting. Josh, this is, I mean, you love this movie, right? I love so, this movie. Okay. Um, for me, this was, and still is a classic. It's timeless. Um, mm -hmm. there's definitely parts of it as far as the animatronics and some of the stuff that doesn't hold up. Um, and some of the editing, uh, is kind of like very eighties, late seventies. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still, like, I ugly cried at the end of it. Like, I don't care who knows it. Uh, when E.T. and Elliot say goodbye, I was just like, like the emoji. Um, I just think that this is what Spielberg does the best. He takes a typically sci-fi type storyline and he turns it into an emotional family film that stands the test of time and you can show for generations. Um Last time I saw this movie, we actually watched it in college, Justin, um, in Dr. Bacher's class. Uh, this was the first movie we actually ever had to watch as um, film students. Uh, and I remember watching it then and being like, damn, this is still good. And watching it this week, I was still like, damn, this is still good. The only other movie that I'm like that with is Jurassic Park. Oh, really? Who directed that one? uh steven <laughs> fucking spielberg yeah, interesting heard we'll, of him yeah we'll, we'll come around to that connection in a minute anyway but uh i will say that i have never really been an et fan like when i was a kid i this movie scared the crap out of me i thought it was really yeah because you're a and, pigeon like, yeah uh it's seriously like i i was uncomfortable with this movie in the way a lot of people like a nightmare on elm street or not nightmare on elm street nightmare before christmas and love i'm just like terrified too. by that movie i love that yeah movie et too. creeps me out and i haven't seen it probably since i was a child and going back now and watching it i still was definitely creeped out by the movie like there's just so much about it that it makes me like makes my skin crawl so the magic that people feel with this movie and i really hate to to say that because, you know, I'm representing my alma mater, Amazon Entertainment, today. But, uh, yeah, E.T. is just one of the ones that I'm not – I never really was on board with. But, uh, of course, it's a classic in the sci-fi genre. And I think this is the first sci-fi movie we've actually done with uh, with aliens, like the traditional sci-fi. Because we have done sci-fi movies. We did The Matrix and yeah. Ex Machina. But I yeah. think this one, as far as, like, extraterrestrial life, 
I think this is the first one we're doing of that. I think you're right. Um, yeah. Some trivia about the movie for you guys, as we like to give everyone a little bit of, you know, some tidbits when we first start out. In 1982, it won four out of the nine Oscars that it was nominated for. Uh, included, it didn't win Best Picture, but it was nominated nah. for Best Picture. We mentioned, I think, during Tootsie that Gandhi yeah. was the winner that year. Uh, interesting, it was the highest grossing film of the year with almost $800 million worldwide. And it was the highest grossing movie in movie history at that point. Yep. And it would remain that way until, until... another Spielberg movie replaced it. Austin, do you want to take a guess at what it might have been? <laughs> what later Spielberg movie replaced it? Ten years uh, later, in the nineties, uh, it was With probably Jeff Jurassic Park, wasn't it? It was Jurassic Park, yeah. So Jurassic Park took the claim of highest grossing movie after that. Now, of course, it's Avengers Endgame. Um, but yeah, it was the highest grossing movie of the year and the highest grossing of all time until that point. Another piece of cool information: it had the longest theatrical run of any movie in cinema cinema history. It was in theaters for over a year, yeah. which is unheard of. I right? Mean, it's you know, wow. Star Wars was a distant <laughs> second at forty four weeks, but yeah, I mean, most movies now, you know, even an Avengers size one will top out after six eight months, you know, after uh, you know so long. So the fact that it was in theaters for over a year like blows my mind. I think that's phenomenally cool. Mm -hmm. um, a cool piece of info about E. T. From the novelization of the book, E.T. is 10 million years old. Did you guys, did anybody know that? Or did anyone have an inkling of that? Like 10 million years old? When I read that, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> We're going to get into it <laughs> yeah. because uh, this isn't the only movie E.T.'s in. Uh, it is not. That leads us to our last piece of trivia that I have, uh, which is, act, Josh, do you want to take this one, actually? Sure. Since you had it teed okay. up there. So let's pull it up here. Austin, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is good. I, 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 I not... love this. Okay. Yeah. So here's E.T. Mm-hmm going trick-or-treating mm -hmm. and he sees this this familiar figure kind of strutting along and he turns around and he goes home 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 <laughs> and why is he doing that justin why is he so familiar with yoda? why does he I... know who yoda is because he knows yoda from the uh republic okay when yoda would give speeches about coming together and like oh, look at there they are bottom left let's zoom in on boom et's yeah et's siblings maybe in the star wars universe this is the phantom menace uh in one of the scenes there so uh they could exist in the same universe technically e. uh, yoda. they do exist yeah. in the same universe and justin let's let's just dive let's just 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 let's do it In E.T., he identifies Yoda as home, right? We know E.T.'s English isn't real great, right? He's trying to signal to Elliot, like, hey, send me with him. He can get me back to where I need to be, right? Okay. E.T. also did seem to show um, some some abnormal powers, even for an alien. Maybe some oh my force-sensitive oh powers. <laughs> no way. And, you know, well, he, he, he has, like, you know, the glowing heart and the glowing finger. Do you think that that is the, the concentration of metachlorians in his body showing through? Oh Maybe. Oh and, you know, E.T. has that really specific healing power, right? Which is making me think about the most recent Star Wars. Um, Don't you dare. Have you ever heard of a guy called uh, Darth Plagueis the Wise who was able to heal people with the Force? <laughs> E.T. is a Sith Lord. Him and a Jar Jar whipping it around. <laughs> Not even a in Jedi. The swamps, <laughs> just fucking shit up. No, he. First of all, he you're, votes you're for talking, Palpatine. You're talking His about people, him being in in as a part of the Force. A the force Asogians. That's right. And they have names. The Asogians. You're saying ET is not even a Jedi. He's a Sith. He's a Sith. <laughs> oh. At least supporter, if not a Sith Lord. ET Sith supporter. Austin, can you can you please talk this guy down? Because I don't. I, I don't. This know feels like a stretch. It's not a stretch! <laughs> it's all right in front of you! Open your fucking eyes! He does the thing with the planets and everything, but I I, I don't know. Austin, I can't buy this at all. Let Please. the anger throw through you. <laughs> um, Please, I don't talk about, some sentence to him. I don't know exactly if it's a connection with, like, dark Star Wars, but, I mean, we saw it for, like, in The Mandalorian, right? I'm a, have you guys seen that? I have not, no. All I know is Baby Yoda's in it. All right, so I won't spoil anything then, but he does some, He does a force heal in one of these, and that makes me feel like he's more associated with Yoda and Baby Yoda than a, a crazy conspiracy like Jar Jar being the Sith 
<laughs> yeah, that one's a little out there. But I mean, I can't say that those points you make don't make sense. Exactly. I mean, you definitely levitate objects. Because they objects fucking make sense. Heals people, even though, yeah. Um, but that's not the only Star Wars reference in this movie. Obviously, Spielberg oh um, kind of served as uh, I, uh, like Big Brother a little bit to George Lucas. Like, you no, know, no, they're all part of the same crew. Right. They're part of the same right, group right. Of friends. Yeah, at the time. Um. So there's a bunch of shout outs in Star Wars, but there's a particular moment where Elliot's att- attempting to explain E.T. everything about mankind by the collection of odd things on his desk. Okay, and he's like, oh, here's uh, Lando Calrissian. Here's, um, oh, my God, the name. Thank you, Greedo. And then it's pretty cool. He says Boba Fett. That is the first time Boba Fett's name is mentioned on screen in any capacity ever. Because he's unnamed bounty hunter. Mm. In Empire Strikes Back. Uh Uh-huh. No, because uh, oh yeah, he no no. I'm thinking of Return of the Jedi. When Return of the on Jedi. The skip and Han's like Boba Fett. Yeah, and then he hits him with the thing. Right. Interesting. So that's kind of a cool like little part of it. Yeah. Um. Also, uh, Elliot, uh, the Walrus Man has a name. Uh, it's Ponda Booba, and he doesn't like you, and I don't like you either. <laughs> Wait, what are you? How are you connecting him to ET? So he goes. He, he's holding up the different toys, okay? Yeah. And he goes, and this is Walrus Man. And Walrus Man, in the original figure line, is the guy that's in the bar yeah. on Luke's home planet, which is slipping my mind. Yeah. And he's like, my friend doesn't like you. I don't like you either. Yeah, yeah. So that... You can remember all that, and you can't remember Tatooine? <laughs> Tatooine? Hello? <laughs> Home. Oh. <laughs> uh. These are a lot of interesting points, and I can't I, – I don't know. I mean, is it just because they're buddies and they like to throw references to each other in there? I'm sure there are Zemeckis and Back to the Future ones at some point if you look hard enough. But I, it's not – doesn't not make sense, I guess. But uh, interesting connection there between all those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all the Star Wars stuff. That's all we have for Star Wars? Yeah. Okay. Um, real quick, as of course, we're going to talk about the cast just – to get it out of the way because unfortunately not unfortunately but the cast of this movie is interesting of the main group they didn't really go on to have maybe the careers that anyone would think except maybe uh drew barrymore of course everyone knows the career that she had right? yeah like when et's like be good and then she has like just this terrible run as a young adult <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't yeah <laughs> But uh, so yeah, we know her success. Uh, we have Henry Thomas's Elliot, who uh, he did some things after that. He was in Gangs of New York as Johnny uh, Leo's kind of buddy mentor person. Uh, he was in Legends of the Fall, and he was in The Haunting of Hill House, which Austin, you probably like that one a lot. And oh, uh, he's the dad. He's yeah. young Hugh Crane. I don't watch the show, so I don't know. Yeah, which I shouldn't say because hello, Amblin Television. Hence, probably why he got the role. But uh, yeah, he's a young Hugh. Dude. I think a lot of fucking horror. awesome. There's a lot of like scary stuff. He was in that uh, Gerald's Game, which was Stephen King directed. Okay, yeah, that Netflix movie, right? Ouija Origin of Evil. He was in that as well. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because D. Wallace, who played the mother, also had a pretty long career in horror too. Uh, which is so it's interesting that both of them did. But <laughs> the mom just freaks me out the whole movie. Really? Like, she's just, like, real thirsty the entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> she's, like, high keys. Can you be my what? new baby daddy? That's And she's, like, totally she's like hitting on the fireman who's, like, going to help her save Elliot or whatever. I don't know. I, I, I can't speak to that one. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then you have uh, Jesse Eisenberg's predecessor, Robert McNaughton, as Michael, uh, who is now a mailman in New Jersey. So his career went very well. Well, I mean, uh, with a face like that. Ah, he, was, he was a teenage kid. I had big teeth like that. I Actually, he kind of looked like I did at that age. But, uh, yeah, he. I just every time I saw him, I'm like, this is Jesse Eisenberg. I think it's actually him. Yeah. Like, he went back in time. Yeah, I was like, Jesse Eisenberg's <laughs> dad. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> all right, so let's dive into the movie a little bit. Sure. Uh, some of the themes that are addressed, right, they're classic Spielberg tropes. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, childhood perspective. There's a lot of issues with uh, the father, which is a very common theme in Spielberg movies. Uh, Hook, Catch Me If You Can, Indiana Jones, all that stuff, which stems a lot from Steven's parents' own divorce as a kid, which he says uh, in the, um, 
the documentary Spielberg on HBO, which, by the way, uh, if no one has seen this movie, uh, it's a documentary on HBO from a couple years ago. It's called Spielberg, and it totally encapsulates Steven's career. And, uh, you know, he does a lot of great interviews in it, recent ones, where he really opens up, and you really see the things that drove him as a filmmaker and the things that uh, influenced him in terms of, you know, being made fun of or dealing with his, you know, family issues as a kid. So it's it's got great commentary, a lot of great clips and insight. Highly recommend anyone check that out if you haven't already. But um, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, because this came up pretty early when I was reading about the themes and the, the fatherhood issues. As we know, in this movie, the dad is uh, an absent. He's like, they've recently separated, so he's not in the picture at all. Um, and then there was some talk that E.T. might have been considered a father figure to Elliot. And I was wondering if you guys thought that at all and if you had any reaction to that because i when i read that i'm like i don't really buy that one but if you talk about it and think it out i mean maybe they're both they're both kind of alienated people and searching for you know a home in a sense and and they find each other i, I don't know do either of you guys feel like that holds water that theory of et sort of being a father figure to elliot he is 10 million years old after all so oh, yeah very wise, I suppose. Um, it's interesting that you say that because it feels like both of the characters in this are teaching each other things. And you sort of grow on that as you're a parent where you feel like you're the one that's teaching the child a lot of the time, whereas the child is actually helping you understand a lot more in life. So that actually makes a little bit of sense now that you say it. You know, Sith Lords only have one paddle on at a time. Like, this, so this thing is getting out of control I don't know, already. Maybe it's already getting I guess out of like it could be like Jedi Master well, Sith Lord and Padawan and, or whatever you know, they're called. You know Apprentice, yeah. Apprentice, Sith Apprentice. Yeah, may, maybe. Maybe. You know, cause Elliot, the actor, you know, then like goes on to just like basically do that commercial with his Sith master in it anyway. So yeah, maybe. Maybe. I can't even take you seriously anymore. How what do you mean you can't take me seriously <laughs> anymore? Uh, this old E.T. is a Sith Lord. I just, it, it's right in front of you. I don't understand why it's it's so hard you to have, get through your size brain. I feel like you have to go into the brain. deepest, darkest corners of subreddit to find this like, theory. I'm sure it's there. I'm sure it exists, though. But seriously, John, as someone who loves this movie truly, has, no, I, do to, you buy it? No, to me, they're they're best friends. And okay. or, or um, uh, you know, maybe like a similar relationship, this is kind of demeaning, but a similar relationship that a man has to a dog, right? Where it's like man's best friend and like they're, yeah, he takes care of E.T. and E.T. is really reliant on him for, for Elliot for most of the things. Mm -hmm. But then there's definitely stuff that Elliot gives or that E.T. gives back to Elliot um, that strengthens their bond. Um, and at the end of the day, the only reason that Elliot feels so deeply for E.T. as far as, like, the movie storyline goes is that they're actually connected. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't I don't see that being a, a fatherly figure or role. If anything, Keys kind of takes on that role a little bit as, like, new dad where he's like, E.T. came to me too. I've been dreaming this since I was 10. Like, that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that that – no. That was. Did you guys think the character of Keys on that note was uh, bizarre? Yeah. What like, the fuck was the point of that guy? Yeah, a little bit. It's certainly like a, a weird, interesting. I mean, the actor has the sickest name ever. What, Keys. No. Yeah. Keys. Keys. The actor. His name is Peter Coyote. Oh. <laughs> a fucking sweet. That's name. a porn name for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that would carry over for sure. Peter right Coyote there. gets yeah. ripped. I actually it up. think I might steal it and start a career in that industry just so I could have that mm -hmm. name mm -hmm. for my own. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, just, he feels like he comes out of nowhere. And, uh, I want to talk about the adults in the movie real quick and then sure. circle back to keys. But so what's really interesting is that all of the adults in the movie are, their faces are never shown at all. We have a couple images of, uh, you know, they're constantly in silhouettes. The teacher is only seen from the waist down or from a distance, you know, with his back turned here. Uh, or, you know, again, towards the end when they're in their masks and their suits and everything, they're still in silhouette, except for the mom and the 
doctors and nurses who are trying to help ET. You sort you see clearly their faces when when they're like operating on him. But for the most part, adults in this movie are sort of painted as you know this faceless, uh, shadowy enemy of sorts or whatever. And so and Key is coming into it at the end. Um, it felt it felt forced and awkward to me, and I was just like, okay, what what happened when he was ten? Like that, right. you know, what's what's he talking about, and why is he all of a sudden like, why do we get this guy who's like a good guy or whatever? I don't know. Did you, Josh? You had a problem with that, Austin? Did you feel like that guy was weird or out of place or thoughts was, on that character? It was a little strange, honestly, to say the least. It took me by surprise. I like I said, it's been a while since I've seen this movie, so I completely forgot mostly about the keys character until i had to rewatch this and yeah felt as you would say forced just very awkward that they made him be that person at the end well right? and then to not be a bad guy right like mm-hmm. think about austin you're you're the king of of horror on this podcast like normally when you have that kind of reveal of a character like you all like you knew it was the same guy right as you'd been yeah. seeing through the movie because of the keys right Right, hence his name because they only show him you know like his waistline or right you only see the keys so for the guy that they're ominously showing to not be a bad guy makes no fucking sense right yeah it's um it's strange that they would do that because like horror does that all the time where you're trying to figure out you know who the who the person is what their intentions are and this one did the exact opposite where instead of revealing that person to be, you know, that bad guy, it's revealed that it's in a more lighthearted sense. And it was yeah. just a very, for a horror fan like myself, and this isn't horror beyond any means, it's sci-fi ET, but still, it was just a weird concept to wrap my head around. Agreed. Um, while we're on the subject of adults and children and things like that, I want to ask you guys, um, obviously this movie is told from the perspective of kids. It's all mm-hmm. about children mm-hmm. and childhood as our, like we said, a lot of Steven's movies deal with those themes. Um, because Austin, you and I especially, and Josh, maybe, I don't know, you know. But having watched this movie so long ago as a kid and now seeing it again as an adult, do you see it any differently? Do you take anything different from it? Or do you still kind of feel that, like, you know, just childlike sense of wonder? I'm wondering how you viewed the movie now and if you've got any sort of different experience out of it now as an adult than way back in the day watching it as a children or watching it as a child excuse me josh you want to take this one sure so for me like this was you know i think we all have that story of that vhs tape that we broke playing it again and again and again and again this one was for me it was this movie um elliot flying with E.T. in his basket, there's nothing more magical in film. That it is, oop, there it is. other side, bud. <laughs> um, yeah. It's it's iconic, and it's Truly. it's everything. Like you as a kid, like pr- like you really hope something like that would happen to you, and um, and I think we all have that wonderment. And this movie transports me right back there from the feelings of sadness at the end when they have to say goodbye or like the crippling and helpless feeling i get when et's dying um to just the amazing you know friendship and and just relationship between the two of them i think it's to me it is as well written as a movie can be as far as like feel goods and then the you know the dips and then the comebacks and the happy endings and it's it is i don't know i think it just transports me right back to being that kid that broke the the vhs tape watching this movie again and again and again would you say that this is the movie of your childhood no lion king okay interesting answer yep austin how Uh, about you any anything different this time around from all those years ago First and foremost, my VHS tape that I broke was Empire Strikes Back, and nice. I'll forever hate myself for it. Okay, um, so wait a minute. <laughs> here we go no. again. I know where this is going. Yeah, I, I, I can see it now. <laughs> go ahead, Austin. Uh, but uh, I still had that childlike sense of wonder, but I did notice a lot more things as an adult rather than what I would have noticed as a child. As a child, I didn't even know um, pay attention to the adults did not have a single sure. clue 
most of them weren't shown face wise and everything. And you said it's that Charlie Brown effect, right? Where like no one's shown or can be heard or anything like that. Um, but for me, like a scene that I really didn't notice until I did now, and it's a painful one for me, but is when they're in the classroom, right? And E.T.'s at home and he's, you know, drinking a beer. Confirmed and, party um, guy. Yep. He would be ripping <laughs> White Claws with you, Austin. I need always, I always need a partner for it, man. No one wants to do it. There you so go. <laughs> get the bathroom out, just walking around the beer gut out. Good old days, man. Ride um, your wave. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was a weird thing because I had no idea that the kid was like, at the time was feeling the same feelings as ET was. You know, mm -hmm. he was, mm -hmm. I thought he was just, you know, like tired or something, but in this one when i'm rewatching it like i'm seeing his face like oh you know feeling a little bit drunk in class you know it almost feels like that college effect right where you party too hard and you go in the next it, day and you're like, eh. you party too hard you accidentally set all the frogs loose and kiss the girl of your dreams yeah <laughs> college Whoops. effect yeah. that's how i feel right now like i'm about to just fall over in this chair here <laughs> college effect but uh i i understand what you're saying though you so, but that scene, any other ones that stood out to you in terms of like, this is just different now? I mean, wh when I picked up right after that, I was fine, but I do remember that it was, you see it a lot more from the child eye when you're um, obviously a child, but sure. when you're older, you start thinking like for of an adult and trying to hold on to that childhood past with it. And yeah, there are a lot of things that I caught more along this time. Maybe that's just observing, but I don't know. That's my thought. Definitely. Well, I'm similar on, on the same lines as you are. And um, before, first, I want to pull up those stills, Josh, that we have. Because, again, I've always thought this movie was kind of creepy and, and weird. And, like, it always scared me as a kid. And I think a lot of that is attributed to the moody lighting and the setting of it. So, uh, for those who don't know moody lighting, when we say that, we mean uh, sort of gloomy, a lot of high contrast, a lot of shadows and silhouettes and kind of overall dark uh, Clint Eastwood is a director who does a lot of moody lighting. David Fincher is a director who does a lot of moody lighting. And if you'll see here, you'll notice that even inside Elliot's room, look, it's very dark. There's sort of the, the two lamps that create that contrast, but it's just, it's indoors, but you know, you have the one light and a lot of shadows and uh, sort of a smoky effect almost. But this is what we mean when we say moody lighting. It just creates the sort of uh, gloomy type of, you know, uh, mood that hangs over everything. Um, so, but that's always what I kind of thought of the movie, right? And, you know, as a kid, it just, a lot of it kind of freaked me out. And not, I don't think any more than sort of the ending when they come to take E.T. away and they're all like in their spacesuits and they got like the tunnel and they're operating on him and all that stuff. And that definitely as a child, I was like, this is weird and scary. And like, I don't, I don't like this at all. And I think that's the biggest thing to me that stuck. I was like, I understood that whole bit of it more. I'm like, okay, I mean, these guys are like government agents and they found an alien and they want to see what he's all about. Maybe just because, you know, we've seen so many movies and seen that happen with a lot of sci-fi alien movies. It's like the government always comes in and wants to learn about them and experiment or militarize them or whatever. But I think that I understood the whole ending a lot more just from an adult perspective. Like, it, it didn't scare me as much. It's definitely still got that kind of creepy vibe, you know, because they're the guys in their spacesuits that like, walk slowly and it's the lighting again is dramatic and they're the enemy and everything. You can't see their face. And so it's it's definitely a little weird still, but I, I understood what was happening more, I think, a lot there. Um, I think the <laughs> lighting absolutely dictates the movie, but there's two other elements two other elements i think that take this movie from being a oh that's that's another spielberg classic to on the american or the afi top 100 list and one of them is john williams he's incredible definitely um and he is so brilliant in this movie and to the to the point where when we see yoda on screen he takes yoda's theme and implies it, he puts it into the score Right, like he's just—he's a mastermind. Yeah. Um, Wait, before you move on, I have yeah. something to ask you guys about that. Sure. Um, the ending when E.T. and Elliot are saying their goodbyes and it's yeah. very emotional, and he gets on the ship and everything. Very dramatic score. It's the E.T. classic theme, like you were saying with John Williams. I personally think that the score makes that scene. 
It I does. think if you don't have that Do specific... Do we have the same notes? I think if you don't have that specific score, that specific music, it's not nearly as um, powerful and um, just resilient. You know, it just doesn't stick with you and become iconic without that music. Do you guys think... Do you? Well, Josh, you, it sounds like you agree. Austin, what do you think about that? The music makes that scene. I mean, it's very yeah. emotional either way, but I, I think it's the music that makes it what it is. Yeah, without that, it wouldn't have the residual effect that it would. I think that the scene is powerful on its own, but the music definitely carries it. Because yeah. without that, you would just have like eh, another emotional scene. But you're right, the score really like drives it home and like makes people like cry like babies like Josh. So, <laughs> well, well, good. Yeah. well, guys, uh, the greatest director of all time also felt that way yeah. um so basically what happened was is when they were doing the score for the film the way you do a score is that you play the movie on screen or at least the way john williams does it and he conducts the orchestra as the movie goes okay so he's like pretty much live painting essentially through the movie right so in the last scene John Williams just thought like, ah, this isn't working. This isn't working. This isn't working. So what Spielberg did was he said, pull the screen down and conduct the orchestra as if you were live in front of an audience. So John Williams paints this beautiful musical tapestry and Spielberg re-edited the movie's ending to match the score. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's how fucking good John Williams is. Yeah. It's incredible. Absolutely agree. And uh, there was, a, I had a buddy who once told me that uh, in terms of music, there's such a collaboration between the visual image and the sound mm -hmm. in any fiction, right? And he said that uh, one of his professors in film school described it this way the visuals ask the question and the music answers it in Ooh. any movie. And I, that's always stuck with me. I've always thought that's such a beautiful way to describe the collaboration between sound and image in film. And of course, nobody does it better than John Williams. Uh, it's specifically in that scene, but, um, wow. Yeah. It's cool. Right? Huh? Which is because I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate the score a lot. And that's right. sort of a way to emphasize how important it is. And I, 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 I feel like I'm more than anybody, um, a big fan of, actual music as the score like i like when we hear like led zeppelin come in in thor ragnarok interesting i i i appreciate a good score but i'm not in tune enough to notice the theme changes and like like i know that when i hear the avengers like din, din, or I, see i can't even re repeat it right but like i know when i hear that like it gives me chills sure um but I think that sometimes a score is done so bad that it, it distracts from the movie. And we've talked about that on this podcast. So yeah. at that point, i rather see a Tarantino-esque movie where you're taking a song and just jamming it in there. Um, so, like, yeah, I, it's got to be it's got to be Danny Elfman. It's got to be John Williams. It's got to be Trent Reznor. I mean, it really has sure. to be somebody that understands exactly what you just said, that the visuals ask the question and the music answers. I, I love that. And I think that's probably something that more people need to hear. Austin, do you agree with Josh in that you prefer actual songs in a soundtrack or do you like movie scores better conducted orchestral type of music? You're, really... I think you do a lot of music stuff for the, the thoughts from the bench, right? So you're probably yeah. a songs guy. Yeah, it's really hard to say because there are a lot of movies where the score is a huge part of it. Um, but most of those are with John Williams. Truly. Like, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Movies like, you know, Star Wars and Jaws and this one, just if you do something else with it, it's not going to stick. But there are ones, like Josh said, with like Avengers, Thor, Ragnarok, that if you plug music in instead mm -hmm. of doing a score, yeah, it works a lot better. It's a real, like, hard n nail to hit with a hammer, so to speak, because there's two sides to it like um i'm split down the middle i really couldn't tell you yeah well it, it's also it can be distracting when you have a a music or a movie playing right and then a song comes in that feels totally inappropriate to you and you're like why is this rolling stone song playing here like you know it's so it can be very 
Give Battle Me Shelter Magic is never a bad call, though. Anytime Give Me Shelter's in a movie, mm-hmm. I'm just like, that's it. Nailed it. Perfect. But when you have when you have songs that are played so often in films, then it becomes like, oh, this song again. Yeah, Immigrant Song is at that point, I think. Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song. Like, when you yeah. hear that in a movie, you're just like, okay. <laughs> There's an action scene. <laughs> what was the film that we were talking about that the score was distracting from the movie? It wasn't Mystic, Mystic River. River. Was it? Yeah. No, good, Bad, Ugly. And that, too. Good, bad, and the ugly. Although I, I don't, I can't shit on that one because the guy just died, as we mentioned last week. You want me to bring the button back up again, Austin? Wah, 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 wah. Anyhow, rest in peace, baby. Um. So the other thing that I think that that puts this movie on the AFI top 100 list is the way Spielberg gets this amazing performance out of the kids. Um. You know, when he introduced Drew Barrymore to the to the puppet for the first time, it was he didn't tell her that it was a robot. (laughs) Like she just reacted to it. So when she's screaming like that, that's her genuine first time reaction to seeing the puppet. Um, He shot the entire movie in chronological order. So that when the end scenes happening, it is the last time that Elliot and ET are on set together. So he does actually feel something in that moment at the, the actor and those teals, those tears, which would be tough to get a kid to cry are real and natural. Um, and I, I think it's those performances from children that make this movie so iconic and believable. And I think a lot of that has to do, the credit has to go to Spielberg and the way he approached working with kids. Sure. And I, I think it's interesting that, um, Elliot's uh, actor, Henry Thomas did not have, as big a career as I would have thought like when this movie came out Mm -hmm. because he's so fantastic in this movie not only the emotion of it right but just simple gestures and the way he says things very basic facial expressions he's very very talented and he I would have thought he would have had a much more distinguished career than he has so that I agree with you but it's surprising that he didn't have more I think Austin what are you looking at nothing I'm just veering off in the distance trying to catch my thoughts yeah he's looking at home (laughs) um it's out there (laughs) yeah um i think uh to oh i remember so it's really interesting this movie was written on the set of raiders of the lost ark um which is kind of a cool thing because basically spielberg's just kind of dictating going back and forth with what is her name uh, the writer, yeah, Melissa Matheson. I believe. Thank you. Who is the uh, real life wife of Harrison Ford? Um, so that was kind of like cool that like that's part of like his clique and like she writes a lot of his movies, that kind of thing. But here's here's the real kicker of this. This movie was on the desk of the heads at Columbia, and another um, uh, extraterrestrial based movie called Starman. And the heads at Columbia uh, picked Starman over the Spielberg, what would become one of the greatest movies of all time, E.T. Do you think that guy <laughs> just is like every day like, fuck? Yeah, he didn't, think, he didn't think the script was any good. And that's always funny in Hollywood because so many people have different opinions, right? So like someone reads Titanic and they're like, I don't, this sucks. I'm going to pass it off to Paramount. And, you know, that's like what Fox did. They're like, eh, I don't know about this. But yeah, so... The guy didn't think it was any good, and then it goes. It, here's what's so funny about it, though, is that when Columbia sold the project or gave the project in turnaround to Universal, they kept five percent of the grosses of the movie. That right? was smart, and it actually became it was Columbia's highest grossing movie of the year. Oh my god! With the five percent of its grosses, more than anything, it actually put out and collected the full money for, oh which is hilarious because ET made so much money at the time. It was Columbia's highest grossing movie of the year based on 5%. So. Imagine if that Sega game would have taken off. They really would have made some change. <laughs> Instead, there's like a thousand of them buried somewhere in a landfill. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just think that like this movie's just really the perfect example of what Spielberg, I think, would then deliver all through the 90s as well. Um, a lot of the shots, particularly the beginning, are – they feel like a, tr- a test run for a lot of the stuff in Jurassic Park. Um, also, the use of animatronics and as heavy as, as the animatronics. I mean, E.T. is a main character. He's in almost all the movie, right? Just like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Um, and the green screen capabilities and, and all that kind of stuff. And then, like, it's kind of like Spielberg's like, hmm, 
hmm, maybe if I give the technology 10 years, we're really going to make something. And sure enough, I mean, he beat his own record with Jurassic Park, and Jurassic Park's one of my top 10 movies of all time. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. There are a lot of shots that do seem similar. Like going through the grass, the way the Jeeps roll up. like The way the house is lit at the end, it's like the beginning where they're in the raptor pen, and it's like that same type of lighting. Um, I want to ask you guys this question because I think one of the things – that I felt about this movie going through it. I was surprised at the overwhelming simplicity of it. Like the plot is very basic and very straightforward. You know, E.T. lands on earth, spends a day or two there, meets Elliot. They have fun. He says, I need to call home. He calls home. They come and get him. Like it's very, it just felt to me very straightforward and just very simply plotted. Like, and I, I think some of that probably ties into the perspective of, you know, the children in child or a child's perspective, excuse me. Um, do you guys feel any sense of that? Do you feel like it was a complex movie? Cause I honestly feel like it's as simple as you could make a two hour movie alien lands. He needs to get home, calls home, goes home. Like to, it just feels very, you know, they just go <laughs> right go through home, it. calls home, yeah. goes home. Do you guys agree or disagree or have uh, thoughts on the complexity of the actual plot of the movie? Uh, no, the plot's very simple. You could put this, if it wasn't space, you could put this, kid walks into a mall, parents leave without him, kid cries, calls home, parents come and get him. I mean, that's basically it, right? Just in terms of, you know, space and sci-fi. Sure. Uh, sure. Everything's pretty straightforward, and sometimes that's uh, something that's needed. Uh, a lot of uh, films try to have very complex plots to the point where they don't, they get too complex and they start, frantically putting stuff in it doesn't make any sense um definitely <laughs> batman versus superman <coughs> uh, <laughs> it's just it's very uh it's very complex and very distracting sometimes when that happens so having a very simple plot that people understand makes it a lot better to watch okay i 100 percent agree and i think um why like, you know, all the time when we watch these movies, right, I end up associating with the wrong character, right? Because I... No, not the wrong character, just a different character. Just a different there's character. No right, it's but part, then, there's no right or wrong. But then sometimes I miss some stuff, right? Because I'm not in love with the robot next Machina. I'm not aligned with whoever, right? Mm-hmm. This movie, you know exactly who the good guy is exactly who the bad guys are you know exactly where we're going to end up at the end of it and we don't get the 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 twist problem where the twist happens too late at the end and then it just ends or you know like it's just so straightforward it's the perfect it's not the perfect hero's journey that's lion king um but i mean it's it's just a a straightforward storyline and they they just pack it full of emotion and Mm -hmm. Like, wh- why is what's wrong with that? We don't make movies like that anymore. We really don't. And I think that Spielberg nails it, and it kind of bums me out. Like, you kind of look as you go further and further down his career. Like, he kind of loses that, right? Jaws, shark and water, need bigger boat, <laughs> right? Jaws kills everybody. Uh, Jurassic Park, stuck on island. Dinosaurs get loose, try to get off island, right? Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, find gem, <laughs> hate snakes <laughs> right um it's just there's <laughs> saving private ryan guys lost gotta find him right sure. i mean like it's very straightforward and i think and then you look at a movie like ready player one which has many layers to uh, it you know? or like schindler's uh not schindler yeah schindler's list um or catch me if you can the terminal munich lincoln like he really starts to to feel himself a little bit later in his career and i mean hell if you made et jurassic park and all jaws and all that shit you feel yourself however much you want but yeah. you invented <laughs> modern cinema congratulations <laughs> Okay, well, on that note, where does this rank in your Spielberg filmography overall? I mean, top five, top ten. I honestly, like, I, I don't have it in front of me. You can go online. There's a bracket of Spielberg's films where you can choose them mm. and actually go. There's, like, 50, I think, of them, and you just go through all of them and uh, choose your favorite. But E.T. for me, I don't even – I don't know if it's in my top ten for – I actually, I do know. It's not in my top ten for Spielberg. I'm just – it's not – the magic that everyone else feels with E.T., I do not feel. And that's okay. 
because as we said, it's art and you don't always agree with everybody. But it, to me, it's just, it's a movie that I'd be okay never watching again in my life. I love you, You're Amblin. And I, love and you. You I love you, Amblin. I love you, Steven. Yeah. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of great movies. This just, this is not in his top 10 for me. What about you guys? I think it cracks top 10 for me. I don't know if it cracks top five. I mean, this is like the one of the original ones that I associate with him. And then he would like later go on to do better things. I mean, sure, this came, you know, after Jaws, but Jaws will always be either in my top five for him, sure. hands down. But this still cracks it. It's still top 10. Top 10, but not top five for Austin. Yeah. Okay. And this is, and just to be clear, this is, uh, personal taste for Steven's movies, not technical achievement or, you know, quality right. of the film itself. Cause there's no question that ET is an outstanding piece of cinema. So yeah. not top 10 for me between five and 10 for Austin Moorhead, Josh. I'm just like looking at this list. <laughs> Jaws, it's distracting, close it? encounters <laughs> of the third kind. Yeah. Raiders, ET, color purple, yeah. hook, Jurassic park, Schindler's list, saving private Ryan, catch me if you can. The terminal, yeah. Munich, it's, Lincoln. Yeah, it goes on and on. And, and on. that's just directing. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you could, in theory, credit him with Transformers and um, a million other Star yeah, Wars, incredible. like anything. Um, I'm going to say it's top three. I think it's part, Jurassic Park, Raiders, and then E.T. Jaws not in the top three for no. you. No. Fire Ryan not in the top three. I think, I think to um, – Spielberg was one of my dad's favorite directors. And when I was young, he really taught me how to watch a movie. Um, and the two directors he did that with were Hitchcock and Spielberg. And Jaws was one of those first movies we picked apart together. Um, so it holds a very special place in my heart. But I think I've picked that movie over so much in my brain and, you know, on screen that I don't think it holds the magic anymore for me. Whereas we did not pick apart ET and Jurassic park and Raiders because they're just, they're awesome, fun movies. Definitely. Yeah. So I think I, yeah. And I would probably say the opposite for me for like jaws is a movie that I will watch over and over again mm -hmm. and always feel the tension and always feel that exhilaration when he shoots the tank and, you know, smile, you son of a bitch. And yeah. he kills the shark. Like that's, that's a movie. I feel that I feel it every time I watch it. And I think a lot of people are like that with ET, mm -hmm. but side note, have you guys seen close encounters of the third kind? Because I have not. And I'm curious mm -hmm. how they compare to each other. It would which, be interesting because they're very similar. And I think that one heavily influenced this one to some extent. Um, this one's actually based off of the sequel that um, – oh, shit. His name's slipping my mind. It's uh, Spielberg. No, the, the guy who wrote <laughs> or helped him write Third, uh, third Encounters. Um, but uh, basically he had written a somewhat sequel to Third Encounters. It was called like Rising Sky or something like that, and that turned out to be E.T. Um, and then actually the plot where – the plot was supposed to be that like a family is – um, defending themselves um, from invading aliens, and they're held up in a in a in a barn. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. and then there's supposed to be one one of the kids is autistic and befriends one of the aliens. And Spielberg's like, this is all too much. This is way too heavy. I want to make like a Disney esque movie, and he just took that relationship and made the whole movie about that. So that plot though might sound kind of familiar, um, Austin. Yes. Aliens invading and a family hoarding themselves into a, a an old farmhouse to save themselves. M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Signs. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I don't okay. know why my brain was like. You're that. fried today, bud. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> Too sorry. many fucking white claws. You and ET just getting <laughs> hammered. Get the robes, baby. Um, Let's do it. So, uh, but I just think it's really interesting. I don't remember what we were talking about. Wow. There are ranks with Steven's movies, and you were talking how Jaws was in your not in your top three. Oh, no, okay. Close Encounters. We were talking yeah. about the relationship. So Close Encounters, Close Encounters. Um, I think, is, is much more along the line with Jaws, where it is a true sci-fi thriller, you know, like there's a bad guy and they're going to kill you kind of thing. Austin, have you seen it? Close Encounters? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah, I guess we'll, uh, we'll do that one of these weeks when it's on Netflix. But, uh, okay, let's get into some of the questions then. Hang on. I got one oh, yeah. last thing. Go for I it. got let's a little piece of trivia for Uh-oh. you. Uh-oh. Is on it the... about the Sith? Uh, no. The Sith Lords? Okay. <laughs> on, and I'm, I'm obsessed with the AFI Top 100 list. I've, for years, have attempted to watch all 100 of them. Sure. Um, so there are a number of directors who have multiple films on the list. Okay. Who do you think has the most? Well, is it Spielberg? It is. <laughs> um, but let me just list off some of the people he has more than. Okay. Is it, hello, is it Steven? James Cameron mm-hmm. only has one. Charlie Chaplin has three. Cameron only has one? Cameron only has Titanic. Titanic is the only one, eh? Yep. Wow. Um, Francis Ford Coppola has three. Hitchcock has four. Kubrick has four. And Scorsese has three. And how Spielberg many, how many has Spielberg five. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's Pretty crazy. cool. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I honestly though, if there are people, you know, whoever's watching would probably not be surprised by that at all. No. Because right? of who Steven is. But yeah, when you hear some of those names that he has more of, Scorsese and Kubrick and everything, that is that's Lucas a stunning, has two. Stunning achievement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very stunning. But um all right, let's go back to this movie and do our wrap up questions. Favorite part, favorite thing, what you like best about E.T., the extraterrestrial. And Josh, if you say it's the purple-colored font, you're out of here. You're fired. <laughs> um, man, I think that it. at the end of the day, it's it's the character E.T. It's the E.T. phone home, <laughs> Elliot. Ouch. Yeah. I'll be right here. Great moment, yeah. I mean, it's it's all of those things, and it's... Just the genuine not the screams, sincerity. Not those, oh, yeah. not those creepy ass screams. Ah! That genuinely scares me. Yesterday when I was watching yeah, like, them, like, at the beginning when he's running through the woods, he's like, ee! I'm, yeah. I'm like, this is freaky. Like, if I heard the sound in the woods, I would piss my pants. It was awesome. It's genuinely scary. It's the best. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just think that the E.T. Like, and it's weird to say, but E.T.'s voice is probably my favorite thing about the movie. I believe that was a 58-year-old woman who had smoked cigarettes Correct. two packs a day, right? Correct. And she talks like this. Elliot. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's actually a blend <laughs> of a, a number of people's, depending on what, what they're trying to get out of it. And actually, Spielberg's voice is one of them. Love that. Yeah. Very cool. Austin, favorite thing about E.T.? I think it's just the sense of wonder and curiosity. And I'll go into that. Because where I found it a little interesting that you were scared of this film still today, where as a kid and today when I'm watching it, I felt like very curious about everything with this rather than terrified. I'm like, what is that? Why is that like this? And it made me like think a lot more like outside of the box of your normal cinema. And to me, like that's where this stands. Like this is one of those like, huh, moment films. Um, it's that it's the curiosity, man, of everything that's going on. I love that. Absolutely love that. And I honestly, I think that's probably what most people feel and associate this movie with is that forever childlike sense of wonder Mm -hmm. and, uh, excitement and curiosity, like Austin was saying. Um, and, and I think that's why it holds up as well as it does today. Um, I think that I have to go with the, just the, I'm, I'm such a sucker for uh, film history and iconic moments. So it's flying across the moon. It has to be. Right. And not only because I saw that, you know, image every single day at work for, you know, however long I was at Amblin, but it's just such a instant recollection for everybody, yeah. you know, and it's been parodied in so many movies. And it's just so, when you see the real thing, there's just nothing quite like it. So that, did, that will always be a moment. I did see a parody online though that should have been done more yeah. is this image, but it has the uh, the song from Reservoir Dogs underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just that clip of them walking with the Reservoir Dogs music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking the one brilliant. From, well, the one where they're like doing the slow-mo walk yeah, that in Reservoir Dogs. Ding, ding. Yeah, it's fucking great. Oh, I wish we could have got that clip. That's hilarious. Uh, okay. Um, least favorite thing. I already said, I just think a lot of this moment is creepy you guys who love this movie, what is one thing that you're not so keen on, if anything? Austin? It's got to be the lack of adult interaction in it. I know that sounds really stupid, but it feels like it's only being taken place from one point of view, where I feel like it could be expanded a little bit more 
and that might put a new offset on the movie and make it crap or whatever but i don't know that's just how i feel i feel like if it had like a a different perspective rather than like a charlie brown effect with adults then maybe uh maybe it would be a little bit better in my eyes who knows it'd probably be worse it'd probably be dog crap i don't know josh does not like that one it was nothing like it penis breath (laughs) um i think there should be less adults like i i hate the mom i hate keys like i think it should be totally like if they would have charlie browned every adult not just mom and key like and left you know what i mean like if that would have been like literally down to the wah 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 like (laughs) that would have been awesome okay because i just the the adults have no place in this movie it should have just been from the kids perspective i would have liked to know more about mike and gertie's um perspective on it right we get a little bit about the gertie's like i don't like his feet like you know what i mean yeah but then she grows to love him right and so does mike the older brother i would have preferred more time with them alone with et and watch et bond with all three kids instead of like a few shitty throwaway scenes with the mom right okay interesting uh we had we ranked it for spielberg's filmography Mm -hmm. rating overall i will go first because i Keep okay. putting this on you guys. I'm giving this a five. I plan on cool. probably never watching it again. But I also think anything less than a five is just disrespectful. <laughs> so, uh, so as, you know, disrespecting I'm gonna the call great Steven. Steven. Yeah, disrespecting it. So again, it's just I never could get into it. I wasn't into it then. I couldn't get into it now, and I appreciate it for what it does for film history. And I understand why people think about it the All way right. they do. But so five, I, five I, out of I would really like for you to reconsider your your pick. No. That puts it on par with The Evil Dead and Below Airplane. <laughs> well, when you say it like that, it doesn't sound yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah. You asshole. All right, yeah. well, it's in the record books Put a forever. five in there. No, you can't five. change it now. I don't want to change you it. You fucking idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you it's penis still breath. technically uh. <laughs> better than uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. So yes. Well, it's not the oh, worst. fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh austin um it's a great classic it has a very simple story and a very powerful musical source behind it given in an eight flat boys okay that's an austin's uh average range i think and for two weeks in a row i have the highest score of the member oh, of man. the group 9.7 Uh, you know when we talked about um silence of the lambs and scott pilgrim versus the world they both ended up at a 9.5 and and justin's like why is that not a 10 and i said well lion king's a 10 and everything works backwards from there and to be a 9.5 you got to be on my list of the josh's 100 movies right um and then to be in the top 50 or top 20 like et is that's a 9.7 for me is that your highest one so far? That is correct, sir. All right. I'll that is that. correct, sir. Yeah. Are you happy that you chose it this week? I am. Um, they dumped a bunch of uh, Spielberg movies onto Netflix recently, and um, I was kind of flipping back and forth. I'm like, ah, oh, we could do that. We could do that. And then it just it showed up just like out of just like ET showed up into Elliot's backyard. Boom. And I was like, nope, that's what we got to do. A trail of Reese's Pieces. No? <laughs> Which should have been M and M's. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. all right, uh Austin, your pick next week, I think, right? I hope it's not mine because yeah. I have a movie. Yeah, we're um give me a little bit here because I'm gonna I'm gonna say something and if you guys don't like it, I have a backup just in case. This is your choice, buddy. You could say, you I'm know, just... ugly trolls or whatever that thing is. I'll watch it. You guys, don't you make guys me get, get, get the button, button Austin. <laughs> <laughs> if it's Evil we... Dead Two, that's the only thing you could say that I would be out for. Or the human centipede. Evil Dead 2 or the human centipede. I draw the line. (laughs) (laughs) Other than that, you know, what do you got for us? We have never, we did, and we've never watched Speech is a Little Slur, and we never watched and rated and talked about an animated film on this show. (laughs) I didn't didn't know that he was doing that. I didn't tell him to do that. Like... (laughs) <laughs> Can't escape. <laughs> uh, I feel so bad for Austin. I reach over and punch him. 
Uh, what animated movie are we doing? That was perfectly timed, though. <laughs> it is a movie that people in, let me look here, that was in the top 25 best animated films of all time in a 2010 list by IGN. Okay. It's a Studio Ghibli. Boys. Is it Shrek? It is not Shrek. Fuck! This, it's going to be an interesting one because I watched this as a kid and I loved it. And I feel like it. I watched it again when it just got added to Netflix and I love it better as an adult. We're Next back. Week. Also a Spielberg movie. Next week, we will be watching and reacting, giving your thoughts to Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Uh, wow. I don't know what that means. <laughs> All right. Batman Mask of the <laughs> Mask. I should have had it ready when he said it. He just hammered it. Ah, oh, be uh, better. This, this is a film in 1993 that received an 84% on Rotten Tomatoes and became the first ever Batman animated film to be released theatrically. Okay. It was that good. One more time, the whole title, Austin. Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Okay. Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Alrighty. Well, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, adding it to my queue. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to a thoughts from the movies first. Animated. I like it's. I like to do every genre and every type of thing. So that's great. Good choice. Uh, we'll see how that one holds up for the rest of us next week. I have not seen it, Josh. You've not seen it. I no. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we'll have a bunch of noobs uh, next week. I think you guys uh, like the score. The score is a big part of it. Good so to know. Cool. Good to know. Uh, all right, everybody. That does it for E.T. Thank you for joining us. Again, leave us a comment if we forgot something or if I insulted you to your core by giving it a 5 out of 10. Uh, <laughs> next week, we're doing animated Batman Mask of the Phantasm uh, on Netflix. And we will see you then for another episode of Thoughts from the Movies. So long. Take it easy. E.T. phone home.